It is so good uh, to be with you. Uh, my name's Andy Steiger, as was mentioned. I'm the director of Apologetics Canada, and that was a short film from The Human Project. It's a project that I've been working on for the last year uh, with an organization called Power to Change, and we uh, flew all over the place to places like Uganda, Korea, um, to Ottawa, to Belgium, uh, and to Portland, Oregon. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this story that you just saw in Portland, Oregon, is a, is a significant story to me and to my family. That's my niece, Maddie, that you just saw there. And I remember when my sister Lisa was, a, was, was seeking to adopt this little girl. And I remember that it was two weeks before the adoption was finalized. And she got a phone call from the orphanage. And this orphanage asked her this question. They said, it's come to our attention that this little girl you want to adopt has a hole in her heart. Do you still want her? And I remember my sister you know, telling me that story. As soon as she got off the phone, she said, you won't believe, Andy, what the orphanage just asked me. Do you still want her? She said, of course we still want her. Right? And, they, and, they, and they went through this adoption, and I remember being there at this airport, you know, as this baby is being delivered from Calcutta into my sister's arms, and, and, and as she just adopted this little girl into our family and just loved her. But as you saw in that story, as the weeks and months and years went on, we began to realize that Maddie had more than just a hole in her heart, that Maddie had cerebral palsy, that Maddie had fetal alcohol syndrome, began to realize that life was going to be difficult for her. And I remember when my sister Lisa found out that Maddie had cerebral palsy, that uh, she was devastated. Her and her husband, Ross, were just absolutely devastated. And I remember them crying for like a, like, like a week, just crying. And, and I remember talking to my sister Lisa about it and saying, you know, you know what, what's going on? And, she's, and she says, listen, Andy, I'm not, I'm not crying because I'm upset that I've got a baby that's got cerebral palsy. She said, I'm crying because I just feel for what this little girl is going to go through. I just feel for the challenges that she's going to face. I've watched as that little girl went through five surgeries. To give you perspective, one of the surgeries, they cut both of her legs, the femurs, right in half. They twisted her legs and then they extended them. Everything in an effort for her to be able to walk. This, this little girl has gone through so much, and as I have watched her over the years, I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen her fall down. And she doesn't have the reflexes to catch herself. When so Maddie falls, I mean, she hits, and she hits hard. And I've watched over the years, she just graduated, by the way, this year, but I've watched over the years that she's picked herself up over and over again. And listen, hey, today, one of the things I want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you about what's your value. What, what is your value? What are you worth? And this is an important question for you and I to wrestle with because we tend to wrestle with it in a number of different ways. One of the ways that you're going to wrestle with human value is by the value that you're going to place on another human being. She has a hole in her heart. Is she still valuable? Do you still want her? You know, you're going to find people in your life that are going to have brokenness in them. It's going to be a, a, a challenge for you as you decide, does that person have value? And if they do, where's that value founded? That's one challenge. But that's not nearly as difficult as the challenge that each of us face as we look at our own lives and we begin to ask the question of, of what is my value? How do I value and see myself? You know, you and I live in a culture of comparison, don't we? We constantly are comparing ourselves to one another and trying to see, well, where do I stack up? Maddie, as she compares herself, she does not stack up. I remember this last year being there filming with her in Portland, and, and I, I'd asked her this question. I'd never asked her this before. I said, Maddie, what's the most difficult thing for you to do? She goes, oh, Uncle Andy, that's easy. And I was surprised by this. She said, Uncle Andy, writing is the most difficult thing for me to do. I would, I would have thought she had said walking. She said, it's so difficult for me to write. And then she said, the second most difficult thing for me to do is to walk. It is so difficult to walk. 
every day is a challenge for this little girl. And as I see her, and, and when you see Maddie, she just has a smile that just lights up a room. And I think, man, where, where does she have that joy a little girl that lives in a culture that compares ourselves to one another. And then I asked her this question. I said, Maddie, if there's one thing that you could do, what would it be? And, and without hesitation, she said, oh, man. She goes, Uncle Andy, if I could do anything, she goes, I would love to know what it's like to run. I've never ran before. And then she, I didn't ask her, like, then she just started telling me a whole bunch of stuff. And then she's like, I'd love to know what it's like to jump. She goes, I've never jumped before. I'd like to know what that feels like. And then she said this, she goes, but oh, Uncle Andy, if there's one thing that I would love to be able to do, she goes, I would love to be able to dance as well as my sisters. Now, my sister Lisa, I call her the United Nations, okay? She adopted three little girls from India, and then she adopted two boys from Uganda, and if she had it her way, she'd just keep adopting, you know, kids from all over. Like, my sister just loves people. And, and I love seeing as my sister just loves on Maddie and has fought for Maddie and has helped Maddie to see the value that she has in Jesus Christ. And Maddie knows her value. As we made this video, I, I wanted it to be a little bit more edgy and just really raise those questions that you and I face. How do I found and understand my value? Because I, as I was just worshiping with you here, I was just thinking to myself, there are so many of you here right now so many of us that are just questioning our value, questioning what I'm worth. We're questioning how people see us, how we see ourselves. And I, this, is, this honestly happened. As I went down to Portland and as I was filming this, this video with Maddie, in one scene I asked Tate, he, he's one of the boys from Uganda, I asked Tate, I said, Tate, would you come with me? We're going to go to the park and we're going to film this this scene at the park and I could just use your help and Tate's awesome and he's like, yeah, Uncle Andy, I'll come and, and we're down at the park and we're filming. And, and I, I kid you not, guys, we, we just arrive in the park. I mean, we just get there, we're, we're there with a film crew with power to change, just started to film and as soon as we get to the park, a drunk guy from the parking lot comes out and begins to yell all sorts of racial, horrible slurs to both Maddie and Tate. And I remember I'm standing there thinking to myself, you have got to be kidding me. I mean, we're filming the human project of all things, right? And here, the, this little girl is being berated by this, this drunk guy. And I know my, most of you are like, oh, I bet he's like some white guy or something. No, he was of some sort of racial mix. I don't know but didn't like the color of her skin, right? It was the wrong shade, I guess. In fact, it was so bad that the police were called. And the police were called actually immediately because about a week before I got to Portland, a different racial episode happened in which a man on a train in Portland began to yell all sorts of horrible things to a Muslim woman. Three men stood up to, to, um, to, uh, to stand beside her, to protect her, Two of them were, uh, three of them were stabbed and two of them died on the train. And so they, they called the police immediately because they were afraid. And the people were like, we don't want that to happen again. And, and the police came in and I'm thinking to myself, man, our police force have a difficult challenge, don't they? They have a difficult time as they're trying to value both the one doing the devaluing and the one being devalued. We live in a broken world. Man, and I was there just seeing that. I will never forget as little Maddie, she's like that tall, by the way. <laughs> she looked at me and she goes, Uncle Andy, is that man talking to me? Is he saying those things to me? And you could see in her mind, she's like, I'm nothing. I can barely even walk. But he's speaking to me like that. Listen, as I say that, I am sure there are some of you here tonight that you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have been spoken to in those sorts of ways. There are some of you that have been treated in horrible ways and there is a wrestling match in you to understand your value, to understand your worth. It's a challenging question when, when value is something we can place onto another person, it's something that we place on ourselves, and it's something that other people are placing onto us. And it's a challenge. 
But as I talk about this with you tonight, one of the challenges that I really want to bring forth, especially as you and I live in a post-truth culture, there is a, there is a temptation in our culture today to think that truth doesn't matter. Listen, when it comes to your value, truth matters. Either you are valuable or you're not valuable. And if you are, we need to understand where is that founded because one of the things that I talk about in the Human Project and one of the things that I have seen that, that convicts me is that truth can not only be false, it can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. This last year, I went to Belgium and when I went there, I went there, of course, to eat chocolate and to eat waffles, right? And I accomplished both of those things, and then I was off to my next task. The main thing I was there to do was to see a statue. I remember I walked my way to the statue there in Brussels, and I, and I stood there. I pulled out my camera. I started taking pictures of the statue. A Belgian woman, about 30 years old, comes up to me. She puts her arm on my, my shoulder. She goes, do you... Do you know who you're taking a picture of? I said, I said, yeah, actually, I I do know who I'm taking a picture of. And you could see the shame in her face. So she wanted to make sure that I absolutely knew who I was taking a picture of because she knew that if I knew what he had done, I wouldn't want that photo. He's a man that illustrates what's capable when you and I do not see our value correctly as human beings. His name's King Leopold II. In 1865, he became the king of Belgium. And he wanted to be more than just a ruler. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. He wanted to be wealthy and powerful. So he decided that the quickest, wealth to get po- the quickest way to get power and wealth was to colonize. So he tried to buy a colony, but no one would sell him one. So then he decided that he'd go to what was deemed or called at that time the Dark Continent so that he could go, quote, cut his own piece of that magnificent African cake. He he sent explorer Henry Stanley to the Congo and carved that out for himself. And in 1885, he was named the sole proprietary owner of the Congo Free State. It was his private possession. It was an ironic name being called the... Congo free state because he immediately enslaved the people and began to plunder the land of its natural resources as quickly as he could at any and all cost to human life. He was absolutely ruthless. In fact, we have pictures, you can Google them. Congolese fathers being forced to stare at the severed hands of their children for not working hard enough in the rubber fields. Horrific scenes. By the end of his rule in 1909, he was responsible for the death of some 10 million Congolese, half the population. That, that's on par, by the way, with the Holocaust. 10 million. Man, and as I read that kind of stuff, as I see that, I mean, that Belgian woman, she had good reason to be ashamed of him. And they've been trying to rally to get that thing torn down because that's a part of their history they would rather forget. But listen, you and I have a responsibility that we make sure stories like that don't die. We need to make sure that we understand what happens when we don't see our value correctly and what people are capable of. And one of the most important questions that you and I have got to ask is how is that possible? How is it possible could be responsible for the death of some 10 million. You know, Joseph Conrad was a steamboat captain on that Congo. And he wrote a famous book called The Heart of Darkness. And that's exactly what he saw. He saw the heart of darkness. Because as we look historically at what people are capable of when they do not see another human being's value correctly, when we see the the atrocities of the past and present, what we see is a consistent answer from history to how these sorts of things are possible. These sorts of atrocities are possible when, when you and I no longer see each other correctly. See, as we look at history, and I've yet to see a counterexample to this, we never see an example of people murdering people. I've yet to see an example of people enslaving people. You, you, you won't find it. 
to illustrate this, I mean, think about if you could go back in time and if you could go meet with King Leopold II and you could ask him this question. King Leopold, don't you think it's wrong to murder people? I mean, what do you think his response would be? He would say, yeah, of course it's wrong to murder people. But then through a distorted perspective, he would have explained to you that the Congolese aren't people. In fact, at that time, it was taught that the Congolese, that some sub-Saharan Africans were monkeys. They weren't full human beings, not like you and I. Made it very easy and convenient to enslave, torture, rape, mutilate, and murder them. It's a challenging lesson for you and I, man, as I look at history to think it is so important that I see people correctly. Do you know this was, this was powerfully illustrated in 1906 when a man, can you believe this? A man from the Congo by the name of Oda Banga was brought to New York City and placed in the zoo in the Bronx in a cage with an orangutan. And thousands of people came to the zoo to see that exhibit. It wasn't until a pastor came to the zoo one day and said, no way, that's a human being. Pastors began to rally and say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not okay with this. It wasn't until a pastor by the name of George Williams heard about what was going on in the Congo and said, there is no way I'm okay with that. And he asked Leopold, I want to go and I want to see for myself what's going on there. And Leopold said, no way, I'm not granting you permission to go to the Congo. What do you think George did? He went anyways. He went and he saw what was going on and he there in the Congo penned an open letter to the world in which he described the, quote, crimes against humanity. He coined that term describing what was going on in the Congo and it led to it stopping. Why? Because he could see their humanity. He could see their value. It is so important that you and I see one another correctly. It is so important that you and I see ourselves correctly. People, you and I are capable of horrendous acts when our vision gets distorted. You see, the reason why people can um, do these sorts of things is when you no longer see them as a person, you don't see yourself murdering or enslaving a person. You, this, this is what's called dehumanization. You see them as either an object or an animal. You see them as something less than human, and then it makes it very easy to enslave, murder, torture, you name it. But Christianity, we have a, an amazing tradition of seeing people and their humanity and their value correctly, and it leads us to action. It changes the way that we see each other. It changes the way that we see ourselves. And listen, I want to get into the Bible, and I want to talk to you about the topic tonight of what's your value? What what does it mean to be a human being? This is a question that you and I don't ask enough, and we're not talking enough about. Because, man, as I look at, you know, some of you are thinking, oh, but that happened in the 1800s, or that happened in the Congo, or in Rwanda, or, or Germany, or Kosovo, or Russia, I mean, you know, Argentina, you name it. Oh, those sorts of things happened over there, or then. No, man, if you go online, you read some YouTube comments, right? Come on, you see some Twitter comments, right? Do you see what people are posting on Facebook, You see what other people are saying about one another? Oh man, that kind of dehumanization is happening all around us. If you hear about the misogyny going on, it's a word for hatred for women. Led a man to drive a van into a group of people in Toronto and killed 10 people. Why? Because he hates women. Man, guys, it is so important that you and I see clearly in a world that is becoming distorted. Listen, I want, to, I want to get into this because one of the most important things that we can do if we're going to understand our value and who we are as human beings, there's three things I just want to mention here. The first one is this. You and I have got to understand our purpose in God. You know, it was mentioned as we were worshiping, you have a purpose. And your purpose is absolutely fundamental to who you are as a human being. 
You are made by God Almighty. The, 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 the Bible begins with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is an important idea. It means that the universe has purpose. An act of creation is an act of purpose. An act of purpose is an act of creation. I one time had an art major uh, challenge me on this question. And she goes, but Andy, uh, what if I was to create a painting that had no purpose? And I just very kindly explained to her, that would be its purpose. You had created a painting with the purpose of having no purpose. It's one of those things you just can't get away from. An act of creation is an act of purpose. And we see that God created the universe. God created you. And that changes the way that we see the world. You see, we, we live in a world today that tends to want to see you and I as purposeless. Now, this is a significant idea to me, and I've actually uh, been working, I'm, my, I'm in my third year of my PhD work at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. So I periodically fly off to Scotland working on my PhD. And, and I say that because if there's any philosophy buffs, uh, if you'd like to talk with me afterwards, I'd love to chat with you. For those of you wondering, I'm, the, the work I'm doing is I'm using Michael Polanyi's critique of a reductive ontology as a framework for theological anthropology. And I know some of you are like, what did that man just say? <laughs> it's okay, I'm going to explain it to you. The philosophy guys are like, that's cool, I understand, I like it. Right? The rest of us, it's okay, I brought Lego. Right? <laughs> I'm going to explain it. Some of you can appreciate that. By the way, my son was super stoked to build this for me. All right, I have a, a nine-year-old and a ten-year-old, and my boy... He loves Lego, maybe too much, actually. And, uh, and I said, listen, I need a helicopter. So I, like, he's like, this has got to be the coolest sermon ever that you're building a helicopter for. But listen, to illustrate this, what's called the reductive ontology, to illustrate this, the other day I'm, I'm at the library with my boys. Now, I've worked hard as a father to instill in my sons a love for learning. And my boys love outer space. And so we're, we're looking for books on outer space and and we pull out a book out of the bookshelf there in the library. A book, as I flip it over, that's sponsored by the Canadian government. And the book's title is, You Are Stardust. And it's a book that illustrates to you and I, to our children, that they are made from, from carbon. Carbon is made from dying stars. And thus, they are stardust. And that's where it ends. Listen, it's a world in which there's no purpose. All there is is parts. You are just the parts that you are made of. And I think, man, how dehumanizing is that? Think about the different ways that we treat people as parts. Think about people who have maybe referred to you by your race, size, gender, education. Think about the different ways that people dehumanize you by trying to see you as just a collection of stuff. Dirt. Now, interestingly enough, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that, that God used the parts, the dust of the earth, and he used them and, and, and did something quite unique. He purposefully brought them together into his creation and one of the things that you and I understand is that there is a difference between the parts that something's made of and the purposeful whole that something is made for. And man, is my son's building this? And if I ask him, I go, man, William, what are you building? He's not going to be like, Dad, I'm building like a bag of parts. Man, isn't this cool? It's just a bag of plastic, right? A bunch of polymers, Dad. I'm like, no, no, right? You and I would be like, no, 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 I didn't ask you what it's made of. I asked you, what is it? He'd be like, no, Dad, it's a helicopter, you and I never define a thing by its parts. We always define a thing by its purpose. Don't we? We define a thing by its purpose. And one of the most important questions that you and I should be asking then is what is my purpose? What is a human being? Jesus answers this question repeatedly. Jesus has asked this question throughout the Gospels. It's one of the few questions that he's asked throughout. And Jesus' answer is the same each time he's asked it, Jesus is asked, what is the most important law, Jesus? What's the most important commandment? What's the most important fundamental thing for me to understand about this world? Mark chapter 12, Jesus is asked this. And Jesus says, listen, the most important one is this. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. 
Jesus starts off by saying, listen, there's only one God. There's only one creator of the universe of life, and that's God. It's not you. It's God. And then Jesus goes on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus is saying, listen, do you want to know what the purpose of life is? Do you want to know what a human being is? A human being is that which has been made to love God and to love people. And listen, that will change your life. That will change the way that you see yourself and it will change the way that you see other people. And notice what Jesus says. He says, listen, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandments greater than these. Everything's wrapped up in this, Jesus is saying. Notice that love for God will change the way that you see yourself and when it changes the way you see yourself, you'll change the way you see other people. You will love your neighbor as yourself because your vision's corrected did you notice that the ten commandments the first three are all about your view of god and then the rest are about your view of people as soon as your view of god is distorted your view of people will be distorted it's interesting by the way one of the first arguments against slavery was a christian by the name of gregory nissa in the fourth century you know his argument against slavery was he said this he says when someone turns the property of god into his own property and assumes dominion over his own kind so as to think himself the owner of men and women what is he doing but overstepping his own nature through pride regarding himself as something different from his subordinates you know we have a question for that kind of pride who do you think you are who do you think you are to enslave torture murder somebody who doesn't belong to you you belong to God. You are his creation, and it is his purpose that he has designed you. You and I have been made to love and to be loved, to know and to be known. You and I have been made, this is my second point, you and I have been not only made with a purpose, you and I have been made in the image of God. We have been made in God's image image and one of the questions that you and I should be asking ourselves is what does God look like what is that image it's interesting I was listening to a, a theologian who had um, it was actually I was listening to his son he was talking about his dad how his dad had served in World War II and he he was there as a medic and he came alongside a dying soldier and he could see that his wounds were were um, uh, fatal and the soldier was scared as he was dying and he stood there and he, 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 he just held him as this man died. And, and right before he died, he looked at this theologian and he said, he said, what's God like? And he was asking because he was scared because he knew his destiny. You know, listen, I fear for some of us because I think some of us just go along living as though there's not coming a day that you will meet your maker. There is a day that you will see God. And this man knew that day was coming right now. And that theologian looked at him and he said, listen, you look at Jesus. Jesus is the image, Paul tells us in 1 Colossians, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus is the image of God. What does God look like? God, the Bible tells us, looks like a family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God looks like relationship. God looks like a God that doesn't just sit up on his throne far removed from his creation, but a God who intimately was incarnated into that world because he loves you. That God who made you in his image and his desire to be in relationship with you, you've been designed, you've been created, not only with the purpose of relationship, but in the image of a relational God that you might know relationship. And I'm telling you, you will never be satisfied. You will never feel the fulfillment of life and what it means to be fully human until you live in relationship with God and people. And Gregory of Nyssa picks up this in his argument as he continues on his charge against slavery. And he says this, he, he raises these instructive questions. And I love this. He says, for what price, tell me, what do you find in existence worth as much as this human nature? How many dollars did you reckon the equivalent of the likeness of God? How much money did you get for selling the being shaped by God? It's powerful. When you and I think about ourselves, when we think about other people, we're talking about people who belong to God and have been made in his image. You and I are priceless. 
You can't put a, you can't put a value on that. And this leads to my last point. God demonstrated how much you're worth. God demonstrated your value in sending his son, Jesus, who lived and died for you. Jesus said, listen, there's no greater gift than to lay down your, fr- your life for a friend. And he says, and listen, you're my friend. I love you. And God demonstrated his love for you by willing, be willing to die for you. And man, as I read the gospel, as I look at, at the face of Jesus and what God's like, the thing that I just can't fathom, that I just can't understand, is that God loves you so much that he would be willing to allow people to, to dehumanize him to whip, beat, mock, scorn, and nail him to a cross. And while he is dying, what does he do? He cries out and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They don't see correctly, God. They're blind. He died for us, demonstrating his love for you, his love for me, and your infinite value as his creation made in his image. Listen, I want to challenge some of you with a question that I I think a lot of you don't, that a lot of us don't think enough about. And it's simply this. How big is your view of God? Now think about this. If you're made in the image of God, then your view of God is the most important view that you and I have. Because the greater your view of God the greater your view of those that are made in his image, the greater your view of other people, the greater your view of yourself. And listen, that is a foundation that you and I need to become secure in, in our relationship with God through Jesus. That we have that sort of view of God, that he is a God of purpose. He is a God that's made me in his image. He's a God that loves me. Because you and I are going to have moments where we are going to be challenged to our core to be tempted to devalue ourselves and to devalue other people. Listen, I just want to end with this. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but listen, I'll just, I'll just share a little bit of my heart. And if there's, if there's people who want to come talk to me, Alfred, I'd, I'd love to talk with you. But I come from a broken family. My dad left my mom when I was five. I didn't, I didn't grow up with purpose. I, in fact, I grew up poor, wondering if this world was absolutely meaningless until I met Jesus and God changed my life. But my dad, my dad's vision was never corrected. My dad left my family. He he moved away, never called, never visited. I've only seen my dad a handful of times in my life. And this last year, for whatever reason, my dad's had some strokes and and I think he's, he's bored, I guess. He started reaching out to me, and I'm like, man, God, help me to love my dad. And I I started started loving him and, and responding to his emails and whatnot. But my dad, man, he is still so broken, and he didn't like that I wasn't responding fast enough or whatever began to say to me, you know, Andy, he, his, this, I get this email from him, Andy, you're no Christian. And he says, this, he goes, Andy, you're pathetic. It's my dad. Now listen, I'm not telling you that because I need counseling, okay? I've already, I've already had my counseling. I've, often I'll share stuff about my dad. People are like, man, dude, you need some counseling, bro. No, no, no. <laughs> I've had like, you know, 38 years of counseling, right? Like, like I've worked through my stuff, but I'm telling you, I worked through that with Jesus. Listen, you aren't going to be able to make it through the devaluing and the brokenness of this world unless you're walking with God, unless you're living in relationship with Him and you're allowing Him to teach you how to see broken people, even people that want to mistreat you and look down on you and say all sorts of things and call you pathetic. Man, and I, I read that, and I just walk away, and I just pray, and I was like, Lord God, I know I'm loved. I know I have a purpose. I know that you love me. I know that I'm made in your image, and God, I just pray that you would help me to keep seeing you cr- clearly. Help me to see my dad. Cle- I'm going to pray for my dad. I'm going to pray for a broken world, and I'm going to live with the Lord as he teaches me my value, as he teaches me the value of other people and teaches me how to love. Listen, that's what it means to be human. 
And, and if we want to know what it looks like to be human, Paul says this. I'll close with this verse. Paul says this in Colossians chapter 1. By the way, if you're looking for a book of the Bible to read, Colossians is a gorgeous book of the Bible, gorgeous letter that Paul wrote, and it powerfully talks about our humanity. And in it, he says this, chapter 1, verse 28, he, speaking of Jesus, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Now listen, the word perfect in, 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 the, in the Bible, in, in, in Greek, in, in the first century, is, is the same way that you and I use perfect. It's not like some unattainable ideal, but perfection is when something fulf perfectly fulfills its purpose. It's kind of like when I'm working on my car and I'm looking for a wrench that fits that, that bolt, right? And I need the perfect fit. Its purpose is perfectly um, fulfilled in that. And what we see in Jesus is that he perfectly lived out what it looks like to love God and to love people. And that it's through him that you and I can attain that perfection, not through our works, but through his and my prayer for you is, is if you haven't given your life to the Lord, if you haven't found your value in him, if, if you haven't found your purpose in living in relationship with God and in, in living in relationship with people, my, my, my encouragement to you is tonight is the night that you can make that, make that, that choice to follow him, to find your value in him. Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you for people like Maddie, a little girl who loves you deeply and knows that she is deeply loved because you sent your son to demonstrate just how loved we are. And God, we're so thankful for the purpose that we've been created and we can live in relationship with you, God. We can live in relationship with one another as you live in and through us. God, we ask that you would help us to do that to your glory, God. And so as we, as we close here, Lord, I just pray, if there's anyone here who's just never given your life to the Lord, if you've never just found your value in him, take a moment to just meet with the Lord right now. I remember when I was 18 years old and I found Jesus. I gave my life to him and I've never looked back and he's changed my life. And he will change your life. Just right now, as you just meet with the Lord, I just, I'm just going to be quiet for a moment. I just want, just want to give you an opportunity just to, just to talk with the Lord. Take a moment to, maybe some of you have been following the Lord and you just need to remind yourself of the value that you have in Him. Maybe you just need to remind yourself that you are following Him. Or maybe tonight's the night that you just make that first step. Lord, I pray that you would hear our prayers. You'd be near us and your Holy Spirit would fill us and that you would lead us in your power and name.